Thank you for joining us for this MD Magazine Peer Exchange on an individualized approach to medication and delivery in COPD. Optimal management of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease goes beyond selecting the right medication. Increasingly, clinicians are tasked with individualizing the overall treatment approach, including tailored patient education, as well as thoughtful selection of the medication delivery method. Well, this MD Magazine Peer Exchange panel of experts is going to provide a better understanding of the heterogeneity of COPD and to discuss how this should impact management. We're going to review the recent clinical guideline updates and the advantages and disadvantages of various medication delivery devices. I'm Dr. Peter Salgo. I'm a professor of medicine and anesthesiology at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and an associate director of surgical intensive care at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Joining me for this panel discussion are Dr. Antonio Anzueto, a professor of medicine at the University of Texas Health, San Antonio, and section chief of pulmonary critical care at the South Texas Veterans Health Care System. Dr. James Donahue, professor of medicine, UNC School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Dr. Byron Tomaschow, professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center, Medical Director at the Joanne Labune Center for Chest Disease, New York Presbyterian Hospital, and Chairman of the Board of the COPD Foundation. And Dr. Barbara P. Yawn, Adjunct Professor of Family and Community Health at the University of Minnesota, and Chief Scientific Officer at the COPD Foundation. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Why don't we get right down to it? There are classic symptoms associated with COPD. At least I was taught them in medical school. What are they? Have they changed? I mean, what's going on here? Why are we even talking about this? Well, I think that the symptoms that we were taught in medical school, and I don't even remember being taught in medical school, you're lucky you were, uh, are the things like wheezing. And what medical school did you go to? <laughs> yes, <laughs> or wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness. Uh, and mainly we were, at that time, this was a long time ago, were so nihilistic, the main symptom of COPD was they're just going to die. That was a symptom. It Not a was, sign? <laughs> no, it was just the symptom, unfortunately. Uh, but we've learned so much more about it now. All right. I mean, of course, we're all just going to die. The problem was they were going to die sooner rather than later, right? Correct. And uh, that's changed? It has. We've realized that we have a lot we can offer these people. We identify them earlier, and we have a lot of therapies that now can improve their quality of life, their ability to engage in activities, uh, and so it isn't such a nihilistic approach anymore. But let me, let me be very clear. There's a difference between making people feel better and having a statistically significant impact on their lifespan. Have we improved their lifespan? You seem to imply we have. I think the data suggests we maybe haven't. In my practice, I think we have. Okay. Yes. I saw a lady in 2005 that her FEV1 was 320, 28%. I read somewhere that was bad. Very bad. <laughs> she died in 2016. Okay. She was on oxygen. She was in the scooter. And I will ask all the time, you had a good time? Yeah. I've I got her on rail, and she enjoyed her life, and it was not until the end that she had all kind of uh, complications. So I think that the importance, uh, and I see today, is we, there's a lot of people that uh, they have not been diagnosed, or we use COPD as we don't know how to understand what they have, ongoing COPD, and they just give it treatment, but they don't do spirometry, they don't try to understand what's going on. I see patient after patient that is labeled as COPD, they have perfectly normal spirometry, no risk factors, and they have other conditions mm -hmm. that need to be addressed. Well, we're going to get into all of that, but is it so bad? You wanted to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, on, in terms of extending life, yeah. now, uh, a, a couple of modalities like low flow oxygen have a slight impact on survival. Cigarette smoking cessation has a profound effect and uh, others w less widely used, like lung volume reduction, seems to have an effect. But what people care about, of course, is quality of life. So a lot of people would sacrifice duration for high quality years. I think that's the most important. Part of the problem, I think, and I think my friends would agree, is that, uh, that the symptoms that are classic for COPD, uh, progressive shortness of breath, a cough, some sputum production, uh, far too often those symptoms are self-diagnosed and self-treated. 
So a chronic cough becomes a normal smoker's cough treated with over-the-counter medication. Progressive shortness of breath is too often viewed as getting old or out of shape or overweight. So if you've got six to 10 minutes to spend with your primary care physician and multiple different medical issues to deal with, sometimes if the, if the provider asks, how's your breathing, the patient will say, it's okay, doc, because he's cut back on his activities. Uh, it's been a real problem because as opposed to chest pain or you know, intractable headaches or terrible diarrhea, which you know gets people pounding on the desk for something to help, when you can cut back on your activity and be less symptomatic, you tend to make less of an issue of it. And it, it's the reason why all of us tend to see these people a little bit later in their mm -hmm. course, which is not when you should see them. You know, it, it reminds me of claudication. You're always taught to ask about claudication for peripheral vascular right. disease. Patients deny it because they've they've stopped walking. they've stopped walking. they've stopped walking. Well, and I think that's what you ask them. You don't ask them just, are you having trouble with shortness of breath activities? You ask them, what are you doing differently? What can you not do now that you could do five years ago without being short of breath? How many stairs can you get go up before you're short of breath? And then pulling it back and saying, you know, this is not just being out of shape. But Barbara, that's, you know, it's one of the problems I think all of us have with the Preventative Services Task Force recommendation on spirometry, which is dependent upon both risks and symptoms, and symptoms. But if you don't ask the right questions to get those symptoms, oftentimes it gets lost in the mix. I think we've all seen that. And I think that is so critical, is if you do not ask the right question, it's just like when a patient comes in, you don't just say, how are you doing today? Because we know, at least in Minnesota, the answer is always, <laughs> I'm fine. I mean, they could be bleeding to death, and they're fine. You betcha. So, right. So you need to ask good questions, and you Develop three or four of them, like what can you do? What is your day like? I'm amazed when I look at thousands of medical records as I have for research, almost none of them comment on what the patient does daily. And if you have no idea what your patient does, how can you ask the right questions? If you do nothing but click your TV remote, then you're probably not very sure to breath. I know you want breath. to say something, but I'm just going to make a comment. The EMR has not been our friend. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. Right. Because not, you're, you're not clicking the remote, you're clicking check boxes. That's true. And you're going to say. No, I was going to say, uh, you have to be aware, I guess, of the, the language and the idiosyncrasies of language. Uh, and men, for example, with COPD really are not forthcoming in that they, they would see shortness of breath or lack of doing things that they previously did as a sign of weakness. So it's very useful to engage the wife in the conversation or, or the loved ones to try to help bring it out that in fact all he's doing is changing the remote control <laughs> rather than doing, you know. And, and again, you have to take the patient into context. In the context. In the rural south, for example, we would ask about being able to walk down the driveway to the mailbox as a good sign of some activity and <clears throat> dad doesn't do that anymore. He makes, you know, the, uh, one of us go out and get it. So things like that, hunting would be, you know, in, in uh, you know, you wouldn't ask that too much in an urban area like uh, New York, but you would ask it in uh, in, this, in the South. The prey they don't, would be different. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> the prey would be different. And the, uh, but the, uh, you know, they don't do that anymore. That's something that, that's kind of universally liked. So, so Peter, but that little us that uh, we need to have some of something that is common, objective. So in the goal committee, we emphasize, we use an instrument, like a questionnaire. Five question, one question, the MRC, the Disney scale. Uh, in my practice, what I do is when patients come and register, my nurse handle that to them while they're waiting. So they fill them up. Normally I'm running half an hour late. <laughs> so when I see them, I say, listen, I'm sorry I'm late, but you already work for me. So give me that piece of paper. So I have numbers. I have like a okay. CAT score of 25. I have a, a Disney score that is very high. It tells me, regardless of if they ask, they tell me they are doing fine. I know they are not doing right. fine. And it will help me to decide therapies and will help me to make a okay. diagnosis. The problem with that in primary care is I have one of those questionnaires for depression, mm. for anxiety, for heart disease, for everything. Yeah. So I really liked what you said about the MMRC. Now, you know, there's only five categories. You can learn them pretty quickly, and you pretty quickly learn number two is the most important. So I just start by asking them, yeah. How do you do with walking? Can you sure. walk as fast mm -hmm. as other people your age? Can you walk as fast as you could two years ago? And something like that really goes back to one of those scores. And then 
if I find it's abnormal, then maybe I'll pull out the cat.